Finally, thank you for your patience. Clearly, my life has been insane. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so, hi, I'm all years. Well, I've seen um, other interviews where you talked about how you got into uh, the business, but um, and I thought I thought I saw too that your first um, on camera or any kind of gig was in street music. Very good. Yes. With E.G. Daly. Yeah. Yeah. That was really fun. Uh, shocking. <laughs> but it was really actually a very special project to be a part of because it was highlighting um, the Tenderloin District and how the elderly were being displaced. Um, and it was a very, you know, poignant but an important story that was being told by Jenny Bowen. So she did a, a really lovely job with it. I know she went on to do other really special documentaries um, after that, but yeah, it was wonderful. The, the cast was full of um, very gifted and um, experienced actors. So it was like for my first project on camera, I was just like a sponge, you know, um, Ned Glass was giving me um, acting advice, you know, and he was at that time just a, a one of a classic um, working actor. Um, and it was cute. Uh, he he just kind of took me under his wing and was giving me advice. It was so special for me. The set, of course, was, you know, hardcore. We were actually shooting in the Tenderloin District in the Bay Area, you know, in San Francisco. Um, but... I love it. I mean, I, I have a, a love for, you know, um, I, I should just say I have a heart for the homeless. And, and I don't know if it started there or not, but it, uh, I was 16 when I did that. So it was life-changing on a lot of levels. Um, my mom was, bless her heart, was with me. And she was, I was, because I was playing a little hooker. And she was just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> in the Tenderloin District. She's like, oh my gosh. And they bleached my hair blonde. So that was really fun. And um, yeah, it was a really different, but very special experience. And did you um, become friends with EG? We, as usual, it's what I would call a set friendship, you know, where mm. we became very close on the set. And then uh, since then, we've uh, throughout the years, of course, we both ended up in voiceover. So right. throughout the years, we, um, there's a group of us, EG and, and Debbie Derryberry that, um, we've banged into each other off and on, on different projects. And I've never worked with EG past, uh, beyond street music, okay. but we've banged into each other. So it's been fun to get caught up and we always have that common thread, um, she's so, both of them are super special ladies that I really respect and I'm very happy for, um, their success. So yeah, it was fun. it's fun. <laughs> and also since you were, uh, since you were growing up in that area, like high school age and everything, did you also, cause I know that like Wendy Lee and Bridget Hoffman are from the LA area too. Did you, did you, did you not, did you not meet them until like way later? Well, um, I grew up in the nor in Northern California, oh, okay. so uh, San Francisco Bay Area, Tenderloin District is there. Yeah, but that's where I grew up. So I came to LA when I was eighteen, and uh, started doing voiceover work in my early twenties, mm -hmm. and that's when I ran into. Um, you know, we've all kind of grown up together. Right. Uh, Bridget Hoffman, Wendy Lee, and you know that the gang, the old guard. <laughs> we're young, but we're old. We've been around. <laughs> so yeah, we we grew up together. Um, once I moved to LA. Mm -hmm. And then it's interesting too, because both you and Bridget kind of have this horror movie connection. <laughs> I thought that, I thought that was crazy when I found out that she was you know the poster girl for Evil Dead and <laughs> it was insane to me. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of you know I, I don't know if it's a thing for young actresses to you know get those kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. you know earlier than other opportunities, but it's it's a common thread honestly. You know, a lot of actors. Um, 
start with something like that, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's fun to like see how many closets those horror movies are in, you know, the back of people's closets. Like, yeah, I was in blankety blank and where I start, you know, my first big hit or my first film was, you know, a horror movie. Was that um, kind of a tough experience working on Children of the Corn since your scene was, your scenes were kind of more intense? <laughs> it was very intense. Um, and um, I remember the first time I walked into the church and I was mortified mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm, you know, my faith is very, uh, very important to me. And I was like, wow. And it, as a result, because everything was just like so dark and twisted, it really um, it had an impact on me that I was able, of course, to fold into um, really the, the heart of what was going on for my character, but also it really kind of pulled me into the mood of like laugh the whole thing, the whole scene going on in that town. Um, so yeah, they, they were really dark um, and intense scenes. The, the last scene in the back of the car was something that they wrote while we were shooting. So oh. it was a surprise to all of us. Yeah. Um, they handed me the script and they said, we've got, you know, a surprise for you. <laughs> and I was like, I had no idea what to expect. And I saw it. I was like, yes, this is going to be so fun. <laughs> so um, I wanted to do, they let me do my own. I mean, we call it a stunt, you know, but for an actor, anything that, you know, can be tricky or physical. Some actors are comfortable with it. Some aren't, but I come from a, an athletic background and uh, I've, you know, been a dancer my whole life. So I loved that. Like I loved that physical challenge. So with my pregnant belly rolling over the back seat and wrestling with um, Peter Horton was uh, just a, a kick in the pants. <laughs> it was really fun, but it was fun. The whole town came out to see the, you know, pyrotechnics, the explosions and the right. special effects. So that was a big, a big day. And uh, one fun detail that, uh, um, uh, I, I, I just, it's a fun memory for me was the rap party was done at a local slaughterhouse oh. that <laughs> was, was, uh, turned into like they were trying to, some developer thought it would be a good idea to turn the slaughterhouse into like a mall and mm. not a great idea. <laughs> I was like really gross, but it was a great place to have a rap party for children of the court. So and uh, I thought I saw, too, that even though you're not listed in, in credits on IMDb, didn't you say that your first voice thing was on Robotech? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know that it was my first one. But, yeah, there I was definitely – I definitely worked on Robotech. I don't know, it was a long time ago. I don't remember what I did. But, yes. Yes, that's a part of my history. I know some other really early anime roles that I saw um, back when I was younger too was, um, I know you were in Ixer 1. That's like mm -hmm. a crazy, do you, do, you, do you really remember that? Um, yes, remind me, what, what, which one was that? The, what was the title? Because you kind of broke up. Oh, um, Ixer 1. Ixer 1. I don't remember that one. When was that done? Uh, I think it was dubbed in like 19... 90 it was um when wendy lee and laura laura, laura cody were the leads okay okay it, i don't remember that one but you know in those days we were just like it was like summer stock theater mm -hmm. we were all running around participating on everything and it was sort of like what day is it i don't know where point me where i'm supposed to go and i'll do my thing and point me where i go next so um yeah that's not one that i remember um i'm credited on it I have, I have to do a little research on that because I don't know if that's correct. What about uh, there's some other dark, dark OVAs of that time from the same company that you were in called uh, Black Magic and mm -hmm. um, L L Lily Cat. If those are mm -hmm. memorable oh at all. Oh my gosh! Yeah, those are the wow. You are pulling up um, oldies but goodies. Yeah, those are fun. Honestly, we just. It was, it was a fun time, um, like I said, uh, because I was being honestly trained on the job when I started right. doing it. Um, 
So every day was a challenge. And because we all knew each other, we literally were just popping in and out of uh, shows and saying, okay, what do you need from me? And they tell us what character we were doing and work with us on it. And um, yeah, it was really a, a great adventure. Uh, I grew a lot during that time. It's a great opportunity for actors. Again, it's not unlike doing summer stock where you're playing a bunch of different characters and you're working in a bunch of different capacities on a bunch of different shows. It's, it was a great time to grow and we all bonded, you know, we all got to see each other all the time. It right. was really fun. Mm -hmm. And was there a specific thing that happened in your life that made you want to start focus, focus more on voice acting opposed to on camera? That's a great question. Um, Interestingly, there were a lot of different things that kind of converged for me. Um, I'd been dancing professionally. Um, that was my first love. Uh, and I, I had to stop because I have a really, really bad back and I was mm. in a back brace as a child and I danced, pushed through that, but it caught up with me and, you know, I, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, cause I was dancing all day, every day and, and, um, my body was wrecked. So there was that. So that's when I focused more on acting in general. And initially what happened was I had a friend who said, um, oh, you know, you have a great voice. Have you ever thought of voiceovers? And I was like, sure. I mean, in those days I was doing everything, you right. know? And, and so I, I submitted a headshot and resume. And if you've seen other interviews, I've told this story. And, um, and in those days, you know, that, that field was populated really exclusively by voice actors. And, yeah. um, I was able to start doing the voice acting and I was still doing everything else except really the dance. Although occasionally I would get hired to do dancing like for commercials or something like that. But, yeah. um, as time went on, um, and the voice acting just got busier and busier and I kind of grew out of my um, category, you know, the sort of 18 to 24 range. Uh, as I kind of grew out of that category, I could still play younger, but I yeah. wasn't as interested mm -hmm. in the kinds of roles that were coming through for that age group. Right. And I felt like, you know, I've grown a lot as a person. Um, I've matured. Um, I don't really feel like playing <laughs> these like typical, you know, young, young teen, young adult roles. And the voice acting was just providing so much um, stimulation and so much opportunity. And so it was so challenging, the different kinds of roles that I could do. I really, and I will have to say to the community is so fabulous. Um, I really fell in love with the community. It felt with the passing of time, like more and more, um, a family mm -hmm. then. Um, and I've talked to other voice actors too, who have noted this as well, you know, the on camera, um, dynamic, if you're auditioning, for instance, is just a little more, you feel like you're a little more pitted against each other. And somehow in voiceovers, when you are, we used to sit in a room and wait to audition, right? At the studios that did that. And, you know, we'd walk in a room and it'd be like, hey, hi, you know, family, hug, warmth, no sense of competition, um, level playing field and understanding that you either had the voice they were looking for or you didn't. It wasn't what you looked like, how old you were, how young you were, how thin you were, how fat you were, how pretty you were, how ugly, you know, it's like, it had nothing to do with any of those qualities. So it was a great leveler um, and allowed us to just support each other and encourage each other. So honestly, that combined with, you know, getting married and then starting to have kids, it was just like the perfect um, place for me to land and to be able to work through all the different seasons in my life. Right. And again, like I said, the community just won my heart over as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you kind of started getting bigger roles early, early on. Um, 
because I know out at the same time as Ray Earth, you were Ura and El Hazard. Um, <laughs> Those are fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I loved them because they're, I mean, um, the Magic Knight Ray Earth was a, just a revelation for me um, because it was the first time I got to play like a, a warrior girl, you know, who had was such a well-rounded character and, and went through so much. So it really kind of opened me up to being able to play other roles and I, you know, I just, I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I got. I got to play so many, you know, like you said, Al Hazard, and I got to do a lot of really fun, challenging, different kinds of roles from that point forward. I'm very thankful for it because I grew a lot as an actress. My mm -hmm. confidence grew. And with Ray, Earth, with Ray Earth specifically, in the second season, when, um, when the main antagonist is Nova, which is kind of like a darker version of Hikaru, was that mm -hmm. was your like was your approach to I don't know doing her character more different since she that's kind of a more serious mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really it really is different, and you have to be very intentional when you are um, adjusting the nuance of a character like that mm -hmm. um, because the character still has to be recognizable underneath that layer that now is on top of, you know, in this case, Hikaru. So it was still Hikaru, but it had this dark layer on top. So mm -hmm. um, it is more, you know, it's a discipline, really. You're just adopting a discipline to add a layer on a characterization like that. And being focused and intentional to um, and understanding to like what's going on to help stay connected to the character throughout all the scenes. So right. Slip in and out. And then another kind of darker series that you were part of was uh, Blackjack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're pulling all these up, but I, I this is really fun. Um, yeah. You know, some, sometimes like that that animation was fabulous you mm -hmm. know um the, and so it was really kind of inspiring and and helped um set the mood for right. um the characterizations and um it was just it was lovely and and um yeah inspiring because it was so well done mm-hmm and then when you got the first, with the first Ghost in the Shell project that you worked on, I was, I was curious, did you, did you know um, Mimi Woods at all? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> there's like, there's like no info about her online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, we, we would come in and record um, separately from each other. Right. And, um, you know, any, anybody else involved in the projects, unless we past you know our schedule allowed us to see each other as we were passing and if we didn't know each other we met each other but if we knew each other you know it would just be a great social time and and then we'd have to go back to work so mm -hmm. you know sometimes we could really pass like ships in the night and not even know the you know half the cast unless we had a chance to cross paths during recording schedules right and with with uh, doing the voices for the Fuchi and Tachikomas, what was your approach to that? Like, what were you told to do, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I honestly, I think <clears throat> a tiny, childlike, playful, um, spunky. I don't remember all the directions given, but of course, you know, we all had similar voices. Yeah. Uh, they, they cast us because of our voices. And I, you know, naturally have that, uh, I have sort of a, a, I can have sort of a tinny, you know, sound mm -hmm. in my voice. So that's helpful. It sounded like a machine, you know, uh, but just keeping them, you know, I love those characters because they were so like surprisingly um playful and childlike and and silly you know that we just had a lot of fun with them and with that since there was uh more than one uh voice actress for those did you did you and like sandy fox and rebecca forstadt all record together with those 
No, we still recorded separately. It was just oh. the way we did things in those days. Yeah, it was. It would be fun if, like, if we were the first one to record, then we would have to. If there were any unison lines, then we would lay that track, and the you know actors that would come in after us or the actresses would match that. Yeah. Read for timing and and you know um so if I came in second or third I would get to hear their performance, you know for the lines around mine or the unison lines. And one uh, one big anime movie that I watched a lot uh, when I was growing up that you were a part of was uh, Mayuka in the second Tenshi movie. And that was a, another cool role since she's, you know, so innocent, but then she's being controlled by this, you know, evil character. Uh, do you remember much about, about that? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember a little bit about it. And I loved playing characters like that because I felt like um, there was just more um, dramatic range Mm-hmm. for the character and and I appreciated it also because I have a young sounding voice and right. um sometimes the young characters could be kind of linear you know mm-hmm. and not not have as much range so having those opportunities like Hikaru when she had her alter ego and and this character as well um I loved the opportunity to uh show more dimension Mm-hmm. you know bring more dimension to the character it's just it's more fun as an actress it's more challenging mm-hmm. i think the probably the darkest series you worked on would have been lane yeah probably <laughs> yeah yeah i have to i i mean i know i worked on a lot of different ones but um yeah that probably was and sometimes you know when we're doing the role sometimes we get to see the project you know we get to see a lot of it sometimes we only see a little of it and so it depends you know if we follow up and you know get to see the finished project you know finished product we have a better idea of the context but sometimes you don't realize and you're just relying on the director to help you understand the weight and the the stakes and the tone of the project. Right. So in those instances, um, you know, I had to really rely on the, on the director because I didn't know anything about it except what the director was telling me. So that, that's what helps me get into it. You know, see that and seeing my part, which isn't always, you know, the whole story. You know, so I'm going in and I'm doing, and that's the thing with anime is I'm doing the little, and voiceovers in general, you're doing these little pieces and you're trusting the director to keep you within the bounds of the scope of the whole story, again, and the tone and the mood. Mm-hmm. So I it's, think, it's yeah, go ahead. Well, I think that also makes it more interesting with darker series when there's uh, voice actors with voices like yours that makes it... Mm-hmm. Stand out, stand out more and makes it a little bit more unsettling even. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's, you know, that's a common, um, you see that a lot in, in creepy anything, like from live action, you, right. you know, to, to animation, that contrast, like you said, it, um, it does add a nice dimension to it of just like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> cute little yeah. voice, creepy little character. Um, it's, um, Kind of counterintuitive, you know, mm-hmm. but it it does it does add a great layer um, to the creepiness. <laughs> right. What about with? Um, oh yeah, you were one of the main main characters on Battle Athletes. Oh yeah, that was fun. That was so fun. That might have been one of my favorite. Well, because it was a very different role for me. Yeah. Very, very fun. I had a blast on that one. Just a blast. Um, again, because it was stretching me as an actress, you know? I was exploring a new new voice, a new character, a new, you know, energy. So it was a blast. It was a blast. I was discovering it as I was recording it, you know? So 
right. which often happens. <laughs> you know, you don't know what you can do till somebody goes, hey, can you do this? And you're like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And, you know, it's always fun when it comes out the way you imagine it in your head or the way the production team or the director, or, um, you know, they're imagining it or what they're wanting. So it was mm -hmm. really fun. Well, then another comedic role, big role for you was uh, Sarah in Love, Hina. Oh my gosh, yeah. Had a blast with her too. I loved, the, I loved that that was getting the chance to play these characters because mm -hmm. they were, you know, to the left or to the right of where my voice lived, you know? So it was a challenge, but it was also fun. Um, you know, that's what we want as actors is we want a chance to do things that are slightly different than us. And that's yeah. also a, a thrill for voice acting is, uh, would I have been cast as her in live action? Nope. But I got to do her in animation, you know? And it's like, I love that, discovering those voices and those kinds of characters and, you know, bringing them to life. And for me, another big uh, role person, like, was I played the... I was really into the dot the dot hack games. Oh, mm -hmm. I know you were Ryoko in that, and she was a really fun, cute character. <laughs> <laughs> that was another fun one. It was really fun for me. Yeah, that there's a. I feel like that season in particular, like that era in particular, for me was like all over the map. I was right. doing extremes, you know. Um, again, super grateful, super grateful that I got to do that. And um, just so fun, wacky, fun, silly. I kind of fell in love with that type of character right. um, during that time. Because um, naturally, I loved the challenge as an actress of playing the characters that had the emotional and dramatic range. But once I was doing the wacky ones, oh my gosh, I just fell in love with them. Very fun. And or at that same time, too, you started consistently being in video games way more often. Um, was that like a different approach for you in terms of dubbing or is that harder or easier? Or... Doing the video games? Yeah. Compared to, mm -hmm. yeah, it's honestly, I would say, okay, it's very different. So it's hard to like, they're kind of apples and oranges. You know, mm -hmm. when you're doing anime, you have the story unfolding in front of you. You know, you get to see the dynamic, you get to hear nuance in the original Japanese read, um, you get to see the characters interacting, you get to see the mood and the tone, you get to see so much um, in the scene that you're in. Mm -hmm. And then cut over to video games and, you know, uh, if you're recording, you know, uh, video game characters, you usually will have a picture of the character. You'll have a description. If you've auditioned for the character, you have a sense of it and they'll play the audition rep that they liked. So you have your own voice as a reference and then the picture as a reference and then lines, a bunch of lines that are almost always out of context. Sometimes, and it's rare, you'll see your lines in the context of a scene with another character because it is a scene. Mm -hmm. um, but usually the lines are all out of context. And right. the directors for video games, their job is really important because they're helping you have, you know, understand the context for each line. Because it could be like, um, hey, get out of there, for instance. And you have no idea, you know, is she silly, playful in that moment? Is, the, is it a dangerous moment? Is it a dramatic moment? Who's she speaking to? What's the context? Um, and again, you know, a lot of the lines have to fit in a, the broader context too of the playability, you know, how is it going to be played out? So they do have, you know, those lines that are specific to scenes then they have the lines that are um, going to be uh, variable. You know, they're more player specific. And, um, and then you have all the reactions, which are also generic, but slightly specific, you know? So if they say, okay, th we want three impact reactions, you know, and then we want three damage reactions, and then we need three death reactions, okay? 
um, or effort reactions as well. So they're telling you, okay, we want a small, medium, and large effort. We want a small, medium, and large, you know, impact or damage, and then a small, medium, and large death, you know? So it's, it is literally like you're plucking these things out of thin air with um, the boundaries and the parameters of the character right. holding everything together. And, and then the tone, you know, of the show and any, any details that the director gives you. That's very different. You're, you know, you're relying heavily on the director. Um, and although you do rely on the director for animation to hold you in the context of the show at large, you have so much to help you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the anime dubbing, original animation ends up being quite a bit like uh, video games in the sense that, um, except that you have this, you know, you have the whole story, like I can read a whole script. So I have the whole story as context. So it's like three different, you know, perspectives, three different approaches. In terms of video games, again, uh, do you have much of an attachment with the, because there were, you played three different characters in um the dynasty and samurai warriors series Mm -hmm. yeah i loved that because i my my husband's a history buff and he got me addicted so anything that's got um any historical connection you know it has the weight of of something historical or it has the um authenticity historical authenticity um i just i i found love with it because of that connection to um a, a real time you right. know real space as opposed to fantasy which is also fun but so so i really liked that i, I loved the um team that was working on it uh, i just love them i respect them so much uh so the direction was fabulous um and um yeah i loved the weight of it because of that because of the context mm. you know it added a weight and a dimension to the to the performance to the characterization when i and when i talked to um terrence stone he said that uh when he was since he was one of the main characters all throughout every dynasty warriors game he said that um you guys were told not that you couldn't really emote as much because the they wanted the they wanted the dialogue to be more like how they would talk like way 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 back then mm-hmm yeah, that you're you're having to take again. It's like that tone. It's that tone direction, mm-hmm. you know, um, the mood and the tone and the context. So very, you know, um, stylized but natural at the same time. So stylized to the to the period, but also not animation, not anime, not a, as they say, sort of a charactery voice, you know. Um, which is lovely. Again, it's just another discipline. Right. You know, you're using that direction to sort of harness the way it comes out of your body, you know, and harness and direct the way it's going to sound. And um, it affects everything, timing, pace, energy, uh, volume, um, dialect. So those are the things you have to take into consideration when you're doing a character like that. And this is probably obvious too, but uh, does making, you know, the fighting sounds and whatever, does that take a lot out of you? It, it should. <laughs> <laughs> it should if you're, if you're, you know, committed to it. Um, uh, but there's also that balance of you want to support yourself vocally so you're not damaging yourself. So you want the proper support vocally, but you also need to actually physicalize what's mm. happening right. um, because it has a huge impact on the way the sound leaves your body. You know, if you're actually doing something, some motion that matches what the character is doing, it will be more authentic sounding. Right. And so moving ahead a little bit, when you started to be in original animation, like Ever After High and... Uh, Secret Millionaires Club was that that was probably a, well, way more easy for you since you know it wasn't constrained like anime is. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. It's it's freeing. Mm-hmm. Um it's freeing and um at the same time a little bit more of a discipline 
because you have to, um, you can't rely on the image in front of you. Right. So you really have to pay attention to what the director, how the director is, you know, describing what's going to happen around you, you know, in that scene, this is going on, that's going on. Um, he'll describe like, um, the way it's going to be animated, uh, he'll describe or she'll describe, um, you know, things going on around you that will impact uh, your read. Um, so it's, it's, it's more, I say, more imagination mm -hmm. than manage, you know, both require managing a lot of details. You know, if you're doing dubbing, you're managing the details of everything that you see. Um, when you're doing original animation, you're managing all the details of what you're hearing or reading. So it's, it's, dis it's a discipline. Um, you can't, you know, phone things like that in because you have to be very intentional about how you're reading the lines because they have to work in the context yeah. um, and be in character. <laughs> But I love, I mean, it's one of the best parts about original animation is when we get to read, um, you know, the whole cast gets to come in and read together. Yeah. Um, that's a little slice of heaven because it's, it reminds us of the theater days and um, we get to hear each other and play off of each other. And the energy in the room is usually palpable because you've got a bunch of really great actors sitting all around you performing, you know, bringing their A game. So it's, it's great. It's stimulating. It's challenging. It's inspiring. It's it, enjoyable. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a treat. It's just a different treat. You know, they each have something uh, fun about them. Uh, I love the intellectual challenge of animation, you know, managing all those pieces. Um, and I love the creative challenge of original animation. Hmm. I didn't want to bring up too, uh, because I know you mentioned that you were a professional mime for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, did that, did, did doing that, uh, it might be silly, but I thought maybe you'd have a good answer um, when you were doing that. Did that kind of help you at all later on for voiceover stuff? That's actually a really great question. I think <clears throat> because in pantomime, you're relying on a physicality and not the words. Mm -hmm. um, that combined with my dance background and my theater background helped me bring that physical life to the characters that I was voicing. So that's a great question. Honestly, nobody's ever asked me that one, Chris. So that's a really great question because you're right. It doesn't, it's sort of like, how could something that's silent contribute to a career that's all voice, but it forces you to learn how to communicate without your voice. And so yeah. when you add the voice, um, the voice really ultimately should be a reflection of things that are going on in your body as well as in your head. So, um, it does, it does, it does help. It's a great question. And so one of your, I know one of your, it was back in 2014, 2015, but one of your more recent bigger roles in anime was the newer Tenchi Muyo series, uh, as Momo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That honestly, I had, you know, that was really fun. And, um, it was really neat to be able to, to do that. Cause I hadn't done that in a while. Um, and, um, yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of classic. So it was really fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it for that. Mm -hmm. Are are you also close with any of the, um, Tenchi cast? Cause I know that it's kind of stayed the same ever since it got dubbed. Yeah. It was actually really fun to, um, run into friends that I hadn't seen for a while. Right. <laughs> so that was, a, it's just a treat. Like I said, it's a family and, um, just a joy. We have such a history together. Um, you know, we don't get to work together, but like in doing this show, I'd be like, oh, is that so-and-so? You know, cause I'd hear the voice and they'd be like, yeah, I'm like, oh, I miss them. You know, or how fun. Um, even if I didn't get to see them and, you know, getting to hear them was a treat. And in terms of, uh, other voiceover people, I do, I did ask, um, Steve Staley and Wendy if they had, 
Um, I'm not sure how well you knew him, but since he passed away, I was wondering if you had any memories of um, Michael Lindsay. Did you know him very well? Um, you know, I, 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 I didn't know him that well. Um, I, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of what we had worked, you know, what we might have worked on together. Um, and I did not know he passed. Oh, okay. So that, thank you for that. Oh gosh, it's been a sucky couple of years. Um, yeah, so I can't remember what we worked on together and he wasn't one of my closest, you know, in my circle friends. So I don't know that I could say anything that would honor him. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, I wish I could. And there's some other, uh, I know some other big voice actors in anime aren't really on social media. Um, mm -hmm. I know Bridget is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, are you close with Mari Devon at all? Oh, my goodness. I, yeah, we don't get to see each other that often, but she's got, she's one of my, you know, heart friends from this, you know, she's one of my family members, you know, from this community. So when we see each other, it's like no time has passed. Um, I adore her. She's got a fabulous voice. Right. I, I think of her whenever I hear a character that I think, oh my gosh, that reminds me of her or usually she's voicing it. So definitely Mari, all my love to her. Um, yeah, she, she was definitely one of my core, um, family members when we grew up together in this business. So we don't get to see each other as much these days, but Every once in a while I do, and it's, it's a treat. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, I'm supposed to, on Sunday, I'm supposed to interview Richard Cancino. And, um, oh, how fun. I know he, he's never been interviewed, and he's not on social media at all. So <laughs> Look out. at you. Yeah. <laughs> You're like a pit bull, man. You're like, you find him, and then you grab a hold. You, you are <laughs> great. Good for you. Thanks. Good for you. <laughs> Getting some good ones, aren't you? <laughs> oh, and then... Uh, yeah, you you were more than one character. Yeah, you were three characters in the Fire Emblem games. Oh yeah, still doing that. That's still going. That's yep. really fun. Such a treat. I actually have a really funny story about that. It's it reflects poorly on me, but it's very funny. <laughs> um, I was uh working on it, and often when we do the shows, especially in the audition process. We don't know what we're auditioning for. So then we get the job and we go in and we're working on it and we still don't have any point of reference because, you know, I was in it from the beginning. So there was no like, oh, I'm joining this show that's currently, you know, this, I'm join, joining this game that's currently going. Um, so I worked on it and did my characters and uh, was teaching classes and the student came up to me and said, oh, you're in this game I'm playing. I just noticed it. And I'm like, I don't think so. And they're like, no, no, you're in this. I'm like, nah, you know what? Nah, I don't, I don't, sorry. It doesn't ring a bell. This is like I said, it's reflecting really badly on me, but it's too funny. And, uh, and they're like, yeah, no, I think you're in it. I'm like, you know what? Hey, I, I don't know. Like, I didn't know if they were using Wikipedia or as a, as a reference or IMDb, but sometimes I'll get credited for things I didn't do and not credited for things I did. And I was like, well, you, you never know. I, I don't remember doing that. So literally within 12 hours, my son, who does video game, plays video games, texted me and he's like, mom, playing this game and your name showed up. And I'm like, what? I'm not in that game. He goes, yeah, listen, I'm telling you. So we screenshotted the character with my name and I was like, oh my gosh, because <laughs> we're not used to that. Right. That was, that was new, a new experience for, for, you know most of us. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go back to my student and go, I'm so sorry. You're right. And I had to explain that sometimes when we come in and we do the shows, there's a working title. There's working, you know, the character names are working names when we are auditioning or pseudonyms. And so sometimes we, 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 you know, things are in process or in progress before it comes out to sort of protect the anonymity of the project. Mm -hmm. Many times it's like, okay, I know the working title, but I don't know the release title, you know, of right. the project. So that was, that was fun and absolutely, you know, ridiculous. And I learned a lesson from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do a little research before I said, no, I wasn't in that. I don't think I did that, you know, because 
honestly, respectfully, it can be a blur sometimes, you know, we're running in and we're working on things that are in process and we don't get a, you know, full reveal Mm -hmm. sometimes until it's released. And by then it could be months or even a year removed from when we actually worked on it. So, um, and I'm not somebody who, uh, you know, this generation is more savvy in terms of being able to use social media to be on top of release dates and, yeah. you know, announcing things. And, and that, that's not the generation that I grew up in. You know, it's like, I come, I eat, I leave, you know, I come and do my job and go. We weren't through the self-promotion wasn't as huge of, you know, part of the process as it is now. So, um, and things, you know, people are on more on top of it now. So I'm having to like shift gears, like, wow, you know, somebody will say, Hey, do you know the movie you directed was just released? I'm like, no, you know, I'm just like, I'm just working. It's right. my job. It's my, it's my career. You know, I, I love that part of it. And so I'm having to get better at the other part. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Well, besides Fire Emblem and so many people from the golden age of anime being in it, um, I noticed too that in the Final Fantasy VII remake, like literally everybody was in that. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun to look at that cast list right. to go, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was really fun. Um, I mean, that was kind of the joke between Fire Emblem and Final Fantasy, like who wasn't in it would have been an easier question right. and also painful for, you know, people who weren't, but I was thankful um, to be able to be in, involved in both. And I know too that a lot of anime people I am a fan of that started at that time to do a lot of ADR stuff for major movies and TV. Have you done mm-hmm. that as, as well? I actually did do more of that. I took some time off when my kids hit like late junior high and high school Mm -hmm. uh, to basically be available for them, driving them around all of their activities and sports and things. So I I took some time off during those years. Um, But before that, I did a lot more of the ADR and we did foreign film dubbing and and dubbing for movies and tv and stuff and uh you're right there are a lot that have shifted shifted over um and i know a couple of my peer group uh run loop groups or in loop groups and so it's something where um it's just a shift uh you know you just have to decide uh, timing wise, do I have time in my schedule to be on call for shows like that? But they're awesome. I, I have been able to sneak in and do some on some um, feature films, you know, do some animation uh, voices on feature films. So that's been like fun to sneak that in. Yeah. Um, I um, I love that aspect of it too. It's really, um, it's uh, very intellectually challenging because you have to do your homework. Yeah. Uh, for those, um, which again, I love, I love that challenge. Uh, people that, that do it are usually super, super sharp and super, super talented. Mm. So it's a really fun, fun group to, um, work with very, it's very serious and the, you know, the caliber of the work is, is excellent. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's just another area in the industry. You know, there are a lot of things that we could be doing in the voiceover industry and that's another great one. Right. And then the last, uh, last, the most recent thing on your IMDb, it's a original animation. looks like it's a kid's show called Deer Squad. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's really fun. I love it. Um, I play uh, uh, three, three, two main characters and um, a one a- other animal that pops up and then whatever other voices that they need. But um, yeah, it's a treat. It started as the, uh, f- the Nickelodeon's first um, sort of arrangement with China. <clears throat> so oh. it was originally like it was Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon Asia, I believe. And uh, the, then Nickelodeon picked it up for the second season. And so there's a new team working on it. And um, God bless them. They didn't have a cast list from the original show. So it's a miracle that <laughs> they're finding all the original cast members and, you know, they're pulling, trying to pull the whole group back together. And uh, it's so much fun. Yeah. We're in the middle of it. And 
Um, it's a treat to be involved in it. It's a great, great cast and really cute show and really fun writing. And, um, you know, the director's fabulous and I, I'm really thankful to be on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I noticed with that too, that outside of the child actors, I mean, it's you and Doug Erholtz that are mm -hmm. like the only anime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 getting to play grown-ups <laughs> it's never something I, I i am it's something i'm always grateful for yeah so one of the last two things i can ask you one thing i always like to ask mm -hmm. actors in general is like what's the what's the craziest experience you've had in your career in general career in general yeah or specific to voiceovers <laughs> well i guess if you can pick like on like on camera stuff and voiceover stuff. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Craziest, craziest, craziest. That's a great question. Um, probably I'd have to pull something from on camera and it was actually, I don't, I don't know. I'm leaning towards, of course, the children of the corn being able to attack Peter Horton at the end, um, uh, and then being and then stabbing him during the movie earlier <laughs> earlier on in the movie because um, I've never had to do that before, so that was like an intense kind of process. Um, and then uh, crazy, yeah, that would have to probably be the the craziest for a while. There, all my roles were like psychotic teenagers you know i was i did some uh, a character on general hospital that was also she was obsessed with knives and trying to stab her doctor i don't know it was like a it was like a season i went through so maybe i would say the season was crazy and then i played like the satan worshiping girl who disappeared on a tv show and it was like i was just like oh i i'd have to say that's probably the best answer it was like this little season where every role i got i was either stabbing somebody or i was insane so, yeah, that would be the answer. <laughs> and then I also, I like to end every interview I do by asking, what do you have an answer for what you would want your legacy to be? Oh, for what I would want my what to be? Legacy. Wow, that's a great question, Chris. <laughs> um, I'd have to say, like, Honestly, because I, I, I teach a lot right now and I, and I direct and I, I love, I love teaching and I, I honestly would have to say my legacy is probably more attached to taking what's been poured into me and what I've learned and passing it on and helping other, you know, kids find their voice, other actors find their unique voice and being, um, being able to be a whole healthy person in a, in an industry that can be hard on you, you know? So I would say that would be my, my passion and my desire that I could be building up and equipping other actors to find what makes them unique and giving them the confidence and uh, the encouragement to follow their, you know, their dream and find a way to do what, know what's inside of them you know what they're passionate about mm -hmm. what about in terms of like your your roles in an anime for like older fans or people that are just discovering a uh, series you've been in um well i i know that when I started acting more than anything I wanted to reach people and touch people and move people with my acting. Um, and so I, I think it would be a blessing to know that I have had people say, you know, how, like with Magic Knight, Ray Earth, how they were inspired and encouraged to like persevere through hard things, right. you know? So if I can, if through my characterization, if it's authentic enough that it can be moving and encouraging and inspiring people, then I will be grateful. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm glad that uh, we finally got to do this. 
Me too. You have the patience of a saint. <laughs> Thank you for not giving up. Thank you for being so kind and, and patient and gracious. I'll and be sure to, to meet you. Yeah, you too. I'll be sure to send you the link once I get it up to YouTube. Thank you, honey. You did a great job. Oh, really thank you. Good at this. Mm -hmm. Great interview. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll okay. um, send it to you once I have it up. <laughs> thank you, sweetheart. It was a pleasure. <laughs>